welcome to the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast, show number 77. Welcome to a real world MBA from the School of Hard Knocks, where entrepreneurs reveal what it really takes to make it. Whether you're already in business or you're on your way there, this show is for you. This is Bigger Pockets Business. How's it going, everybody? I am Jay Scott. I'm your co-host for the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast. And sitting across from me in a completely different room is the woman in pink, my very lovely co-host, Mrs. Carol Scott. How's it going today, Carol Scott? Doing really well. And so here's the deal. I just got a calendar invite for something at 10 to 11 p.m. on a weekday. And I'm like, what the heck is that? Because anybody who knows me knows that I am in bed by eight at the late, I'm okay, maybe 8.15, but that's even pushing it. But fast forward, jump along here in this way too long drawn out story if I let it become one. I realized it's from a Bigger Pockets community member in Amsterdam, right? And it just took me a quick minute to be grateful. See, I am so not a technology person. I curse technology every single day. I'm a master of breaking iPhones and breaking computers, and I feel like technology makes me absolutely nuts. Semicolon, however, really, how awesome is it that we do live in this world where we can connect with people all around the world anytime we want to, right? Through these Zoom meetings. And even though some of us are tired of Zoom meetings, I've got to tell you, it is absolutely energizing that we can connect with people anywhere, anytime. And it turns out that 10 p.m. Amsterdam time is like 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So it all worked out just fine. So just a great reminder that we need to be grateful for all the wonderful things in our life. Wow, that was a long story about being grateful, but a good one. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Speaking of being grateful, I am grateful for our guest today on this episode. His name is Elliot Holland, and he is the founding partner of a company called Guardian Due Diligence. And Elliot is an entrepreneur. He's an expert in business buying due diligence. And in this episode, he walks us through basically everything from what types of business we, businesses we should be focused on on buying which types of businesses we should be staying away from buying and performing the due diligence process that's so, so important when we're buying a business. And he specializes in, in business due diligence. So he basically teaches us everything we need to know to get started in the due diligence process. He tells us about how long it takes, what's involved, and why it's a lot more complex than due diligence in like, let's say the real estate space. I know a lot of us are real estate investors and we think of due diligence as a couple day or maybe a week process. It's a much, much longer process in the business world, and Elliot jumps all into it and gives us lots of great details. Um, what else do we talk about? We talk about seller financing, and Elliot brings up a point about how we can get a whole lot more seller financing than we might expect when we're buying a business, and when we combine that seller financing with a bank loan or SBA financing, we may not have to put very much, if any, money into our own business deals at all. Uh, here's a big one. Elliot tells us what we can be doing up front to ensure that if we have any issues in our business, if, if we need help from the previous seller, that whether it's a week after closing or a month or a year after closing on the deal, what can we do up front to ensure that the seller is willing to pick up the phone and help us if we run into problems after we close the deal? So just a great episode. Make sure you listen to the very end, or not even the very end, but kind of the middle-ish end, where Elliot gives an amazing explanation for why a seller has a four-time greater incentive to mislead you than you might think. And yes, I said that, four times greater incentive than you might think to mislead you about how much the business earns. Anyway, if you want to find out more about Elliot, if you want to find out about Guardian Due Diligence or anything we discuss in this episode, please check out our show notes at biggerpockets.com slash bizshow77. Again, that's biggerpockets.com slash bizshow77. Okay, without any further ado, let's welcome Elliot Holland to the show. 
Elliot, welcome to the show. We are so looking forward to an amazing conversation today. Your business is so very relevant to what our listeners are loving right now and the things that are super important to them. So thanks for being here. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. This is exciting. I'm glad to share some information with your listeners. Awesome. Elliot, you are the founder and uh, you're the founding partner of Guardian Due Diligence. So Correct. tell us a little bit about your history, what led you to found Guardian Due Diligence, um, and what is Guardian Due Diligence? Sure. So I'll start in reverse. So Guardian Due Diligence is a business that I launched to help um, independent sponsors, independent investors, uh, wealthy families and high net worth individuals, or really anyone seeking to acquire a company to help them execute that somewhat complex process by providing a full suite of buy side services. When I say buy side, what I mean is anything from deal sourcing to evaluating opportunities to writing letters of intent to what they call commercial due diligence to raising capital to closing and to helping grow the business after it's acquired. So helping investors both execute transactions. And then of course, we we do investments to make a return. And so it doesn't stop at the transaction. Our services keep going to help people grow the business and that's how you get your return. So how did I get to this point? Um, I spent seven years in sort of private equity slash independent business acquisition. So I've started at a billion dollar sort of family office that masquerades as a private equity firm in Boston called the Watermill Group. Um, and they had an amazing experience, sort of amazingly smart, but down to earth guys that the the person who I worked for, his father started bootstrapping deals in the 90s. And so they're still going on today and they're very sort of entrepreneurial and sort of no nonsense folks. And so it sort of shaped my experience with business acquisition. I then spent six years as an independent business buyer, initially with a business partner, and then I spun out on my own. And what I just realized is that it was so difficult in certain instances, particularly with the kind of deals that you and I can do, uh, Jay Carroll, um, or, or anyone that's listening can do. It's so hard to get good advisors at that place. There's no shortage of lawyers, no shortage of accountants, but they'll charge you four or $500 an hour and they're not motivated to efficiently get something done. Guardian was created to help everyday people execute amazing transactions with great advisors with the comfort and confidence that they sort of are working with somebody who knows what they're doing so they don't get burned and and don't buy a lemon. That's great. And I, I think you left out another important point and, and I think you're probably being humble, but you are a graduate of Harvard. Um, so so you, in, in addition to all the relevant uh, experience, you also have a, a, a very great education behind you as well. Jay, th thank you for that. It's so much better when somebody else says it because I don't want to come <laughs> off. As a, as a jerk, I, I actually am fun to have a beer with. Um, as well. in, in fact, I'll be having some of those uh, with uh, uh, an accounting friend at lunch. But um, I'm also a reformed engineer. So for the folks that are sort of super technical in that capacity or have pivoted in their careers, I think we can all sort of understand that we're not necessarily doing what we were first trained to do. A, a reformed engineer with a business degree. You and I are our brothers. Um, okay, so you mentioned three words that I kind of want to just um, discuss before we move forward because sure. I know a lot of our listeners um, are are maybe comfortable with small business stuff, buying an independent business on their own. But you mentioned three things. You mentioned the word sponsors, mm -hmm. private equity, and family office. And these are words that, that we typically hear often in the business space, but in the larger business space. So just to kind of round out your, your introduction, can you kind of tell us what is a sponsor? What is a family office? What is private equity? And how do they all kind of relate in the, in the business buying and, and owning uh, world? Sure. Absolutely. And so I know a lot of folks are in real estate. This acquisition and investment piece of the market is not all that different. So a family office is just somebody who made a lot of money before you. So they are a source of capital. So think about the Rockefellers. Think about the Coors Light family, uh, you know, here in Atlanta. Think about Arthur Blank and he owns the, the Falcons and all the money that he has. So someone who or a family that at some point in their history made a lot of money and now actually investing that money becomes a full-time job. There's more complex definitions, but really it's sort of like if you made, or when you make a billion dollars, Jay Scott, um, do your children go get a job at, at Coca-Cola 
or is their job to invest your money? When Got it, it comes time, when there's enough money for there to be a job to invest it, that typically is sort of a family office. Got it. And um, I think historically, a family office was kind of wealthy families getting together to pool their money with a with a wealth manager sort of thing. And and so so a family office is basically just a group with a lot of money that that's looking. That's to basically in. it. And I think it, it it shows up in many different areas, right? So the same capital that's going to private equity deals, which I'll explain in a second. Is going to real estate deals, right? Somebody has to put the equity up to, to get the deal done. If you're buying a commercial building, the, the equity cash is probably coming from a wealthy family or a wealthy fund. So on the private equity side, private equity is just acquiring a business using a lot of leverage. So it's become an asset class, just like commercial real estate has become an asset class or a thing to do. But at the bare bones, it's buying, it's buying a business the same way you buy a house. You put 20% down and you finance the rest. So if you want to buy a $10 million business, you put $2 million down and go get $8 million of, of debt. Hopefully you can sort of structure it that way. And you sort of have a similar thesis around paying off the debt to um, increase your return on equity, but also hopefully improving the asset uh, and growing it over the time that you own it to increase your return. So that's private equity. And now there's private equity funds like uh, KKR, TPG, um, here in Atlanta, Rourke Capital that have raised, you know, 500 million, a billion dollars. So those are private equity funds that have a dedicated fund of money. There's also a huge marketplace for independent people like you and I that want to go buy businesses that are probably a bit more sophisticated than just folks talking at the at the local uh, grocery store about buying a business, but sort of have put up some infrastructure, um, have some experience in that environment. And what they're called are independent sponsors. They're called fundless sponsors as well. And they are essentially individual entities or groups of people that set out to buy companies. So it'd be similar to a real estate group that goes out to look in a, a particular asset class in a particular city. Um, in the private equity world, that sort of ecosystem of people are called independent sponsors. Well, all of that sounds more complicated than it is. So as a reformed engineer, and I got into the business world, the thing that frustrated me the most is people try to make simple stuff complex. If you have the brain to go want to buy a company, you can go do it. You call yourself a sponsor and you go find a rich uncle or somebody with a lot of money. It could be a family office. It could be a private equity group. It could be somebody you know in your family. This is not something that the everyday person cannot do. It's just there's a bunch of fancy names for stuff. Um, anybody who embarks on the process to go buy a company, in my mind, is an independent sponsor. Excellent. So a follow up on that for those of us who want to be these independent sponsors. Should we be thinking about buying these businesses with private equity, with family offices? Or would you recommend people go the more conventional route, like borrowing from banks and the SBA? What do you think in your experience makes a whole lot more sense? I think there's two paths for folks. And I would say my gut tells me 80% of people, their best bet is to go find a business that they understand. Either they understand the industry and have known the business for a while, or they actually know the owner through some personal network or relationship and leverage that to go get a SBA loan, um, which allows you to borrow up to $5 million, I think, um, it may be a bit higher, but you can borrow that and the government will guarantee 75% of it. So it becomes a lot easier to get these loans through banks. Um, and so for 80% of people, I would say the SBA route makes the most sense. You'll still need to put up around 10 to 25% in equity to get the deal done. Um, but some of that can actually be in the form of the seller financing part of the deal. Sometimes that's considered equity. And so that makes it easier for people. The other 20%, I would say if you're more sophisticated or maybe you have a lot of great relationships with um, institutional investors, so just private equity funds, uh, hard debt in, um, in real estate becomes mezzanine debt and private equity. If you know those kind of folks and you're in that boat, then it might make more sense to sort of go get private equity or go get sort of institutional capital to make your acquisition. Uh, what I would say is an SBA loan will buy you a deal that's about five to six million dollars or less. If you want to do a deal bigger than that for whatever reason, then you really have no choice except to go to institutional capital. Um, but I would say the process going either way is similar, except 
in the sort of SBA lane, you're going to be dealing with more, your, your local bank is going to be your source of sort of doing everything. So the same folks you deal with every time you go get your, your money out of the bank or get, need to get a new credit card because you, you lost it, those folks would be managing that process. If you go the institutional route, then you're going to deal with a bit more sophisticated of an investor. And so you should just know that going in. And, and I'll be honest, that was the the most concise answer I've heard to the question of when should you be going bank and SBA versus um, versus private equity or, or other investors. And I think you stated that perfectly. If the deal is up to about five or six million dollars, it's it's feasible to use SBA fund financing, um, bank financing, probably bank financing higher if you wanted to, but that's kind of like the upper limit. So it's right. kind of like if you're thinking about buying a business and it's less than five million, consider SBA and banks. If it's over five million, that's when we get into the the more um, private equity and 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 private investors. Would that be safe to say? That's absolutely right. Okay, that is perfect. So uh, I'm going to take a step back, and and this may be an, an obvious question to you, and we're talking about it in this in this regard. Um, but just to clarify for our listeners, we're talking all about buying a business. From your perspective, what are the benefits of buying an existing business versus somebody going out and saying, "I'm going to start my own business"? Or maybe there there are benefits to starting your own business. It sounds like you specialize in people buying businesses. Why should right. we be thinking about that as a first choice versus kind of building from scratch? Well, sure. So that's a great question to ask a guy like me. So I've started a couple of businesses and I've bought a couple of businesses um, and I advise on both sides. I work with a venture capital firm here in Atlanta and, and think about um, early stage investments. Here's why you make one decision versus the other. As optimistic and entrepreneurial as I am, if you just were betting the odds, if you start a business, more businesses fail than continue on for 10 or 20 years, right? What is the statistic like half or three quarters fail in the first year? That's real. And so to start your own business from a sort of logical standpoint, because we all knew we, we, do, we do some things on emotion. But if you're thinking logically, you're saying, hey, do I want to bet that I'm sort of in that top half or top quartile of people with this business idea and opportunity? And if so, it makes sense to go start it. Um, you own more of it and you'll probably have more autonomy. If you're sort of saying, hey, I'm a more reasonable um, sort of bet the median, bet the average type person, right? So I would imagine a lot of real estate investors um, are sort of in that boat. It, it may make more sense to buy. Here's why. If you think about all the complexity of the first five to 10 years of a business, the first salesperson, the first new vendor, the first, the first significant fire, the first issue between business partners, the back office systems, the 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 product market fit so what product to what type of customers and what way when you buy a company they've worked all those things out to the tune of now they're doing 10 million dollars in revenue two million dollars in profit per se just random numbers right and so now when you buy that business it's not quite like a franchise where they have like a whole operating manual for how to run the business but you get sort of a light version of that because some set of owners in some real environment have run this business iron out the kinks and you're taking over all their thought capital and trying to grow it going forward. So you have a playbook, you actually have an advisor and the current owner and the current management to help you go forward. And it's less complex than trying to figure out how do I sell manufactured products into the automotive industry in the Midwest? Some of these things are hard to think about from scratch, but when you see another model that works, buying it can make more sense. The other thing that happens is when you start a business, you're sort of everything. You know, you, you clean the floors, you do the strategy, you call the customers, all of that. When you buy a business, you sometimes become the CEO, but you sometimes become an advisor. And so your role is different. Also, your risk is different. When you start a company, most often you start with sort of a good idea and you're in your garage. When you buy a company, you start with a lot of money you owe other people, right? Um, if it works, then you're going to be very, very, very uh, glad you did it, right? But you have to be comfortable with living with the debt, right? Um, and so those are some of the things I think people should consider. But the main thing is really the probability of success. I think the probability of buying a company and it being around in five years is way better than starting a company and it being around in five years. 
Awesome. Thank you. So hands down, you've absolutely convinced me that buying is the right way to go rather than starting something from scratch. So Elliot, is there a certain type of business that I should be looking for or looking to actually on the converse of that staying away from? And sure. kind of the second part of that question is, has that changed at all throughout 2020 in how just the landscape of our country and how the market has changed so dramatically? Sure. So I'll start with what you stay away from. You should stay away from things that are sort of cyclical, meaning that they move outside of anything that anyone understands. Right. So like oil field services or oil and gas companies. Right. If you want to predict the price of gas for the next five years, then those are great businesses to get into. I would say 99 percent of people are no good at that. And that's probably not a good thing to get into. Chemicals are the same way. Um, there's plenty of businesses that the, um, the the profit moves not based on real market forces, but just has cyclicality to it. You kind of want to stay away from those. What do you want to buy? You want to buy stuff that's in a zone that you actually know. So, for instance, a lot of my friends who have heavy real estate portfolios, they will buy companies that have some real estate component, like a gas station that sits on some land or a, um, a manufacturing company that sits on some land, or a trucking company that has land and trucks. Um, other things of that nature exist in the market, or maybe an HVAC company. Um, I had one client who bought a company that makes the HVAC systems in commercial buildings more efficient, but well, he was able to actually use the company he bought as a customer for his commercial real estate portfolio and improve the odds of his success inside of things that he controlled. So in the ideal situation, you'll know your industry, you'll know the business, you'll even be able to um, be a customer of the business after you acquire it. That's the ideal situation. Um, other situations that make sense are, you know the owner, um, just because you get so much better information if the owner is a friendly person versus you guys negotiating over price at a specific time. The other thing is sometimes people just understand or enjoy or have passions about certain things. Those are also good industries to get into. So if you like, you know, flowers, you might want to look at like a horticulture business or like a, a nursery business. And if you like you know, working with your hands and plumbing and that kind of thing, you know, a small A store might be a good acquisition. So I think the best acquisitions are in things you understand. Um, has that changed in 2020? Absolutely. So I think we've seen what I call like a cutting of the grass, right? And so if you were exposed and you weren't taking care of things and you weren't thoughtful about down markets, you've been exposed in 2020. And I think now we're getting back to a more fundamental view of business. So I use the example of waste because I love the industry personally because it, it doesn't change. The demand and the supply don't change all that often, no matter what happens, right? So if you are moving trash in 2020, your business probably improved. More people are home, eating more food, throwing more stuff away, buying more things on Amazon. Your business went up. If you were a retail store, your business might have gone to zero. A restaurant might have gone to zero. If you're not tech enabled, if your business doesn't allow for work from home, those things had a really hard time in this marketplace. And so I think a, a wise investor considers that over the course of owning a business, call it five to 10 years, you're more than likely gonna encounter a down market sometime during that phase. And so you want to buy stuff that doesn't get significantly impacted in bad markets. Well, Elliot, how do you even know that? Well, think about how that business did in 2008, 2009, the last major downturn. You can either look at their financials during that time. Sometimes that's a bit far too bad. But you can look at almost the Wall Street Journal and look at how, go to like Yahoo Finance or something and take a look at the biggest public company in the same industry that you're considering an acquisition in and see how it did from 2007 to 2010. That's more than likely on a macro scale how your industry will do in a typical downturn. And so that's one way to sort of take a look at it from a data perspective. I love this. This is something we talk about a lot in real estate. And I know a lot of our listeners are real estate investors. And so there, there's some tremendous analogies. Uh, we often talk about in real estate, as the markets are increasing, um, we don't need to have as much of a focus on fundamentals. The market's going to save us from our mistakes. It's going to save yes. us from bad decisions. Um, but then when the market starts to soften and real estate starts to soften and values start to drop, that's right. when fundamentals become super important 
And those who are familiar with the fundamentals, yes. those who, who follow the fundamentals and do things intelligently survive, whereas those who have basically been propped up by a rising market get right. crushed. Yes. And and secondarily, um, I've been saying, um, and because I do a lot of interviews on real estate, my big refrain these days is look at what happened in different markets in 2008, because yeah. history, history is the best predictor of the future. Yes, it's the data is out there. It's the, easy to find. Exactly. It's not complicated. Here's the other thing that happens, and I'm sure you've seen this. In every market, almost in every year, there's some hotshot that thinks they know better than the last 300 years of data. They figured out some brand new trick on some brand new thing that's just going to, you you fundamental guys, crazy. You're missing all of this money. <laughs> and in good markets, you know, they look great. You know, think about all the people who were Bitcoin uh, hedge funds folks um, until Bitcoin started going down. And then, you know, you didn't hear them shouting as loud on Facebook. The fundamental folks, the reason and how you'll find them is that they're not stressed out when the market's bad, right? Because they knew it was happening. They prepared for it. This is no big deal. In fact, one of the things I love about investing on the private equity side, and I'm not sure who the equivalent is in real estate, but if you think about how like Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger of Berkshire Hathaway think about buying businesses, and the simple thing they say is they don't buy stuff they don't understand. They always buy stuff that is very, very, very good to the customer. They bring strong brands. And they also say they want to buy a dollar worth of company for 75 cents. And so a lot of a lot of the trick to this is if you can buy at below fundamental value, whatever your analysis of that is, then you can also benefit greatly. So, for instance, the wise folks with money are out in the market looking for acquisitions right now. As crazy as all this stuff is as volatile as the market is, the people who buy stuff in 2020 and 2021 will look like geniuses in 2025. I, I love that, and and your earlier comment made me think about the thing that I, I laugh at most uh, when I hear it in both business and real estate. This time is different. People, yes. people who think that, that for some reason, today is different than everything that's happened in the last 250 years of, of this country and this economy. Yes. And the slow and steady guy wins the race, or, or gal wins the race. This is the amount of money that people are putting to work in some of these real estate transactions, private business transactions. I mean, if you get 3x on a million dollar investment, that's life changing money. If you get 3x on a, on a, on a $10 million investment, that's, that's life changing money. And one of the things that's really cool about business acquisition that's harder to do in real estate is the returns can be higher in a private equity transaction um, on average than they would be in real estate. You know, like a 15, 10 to 15, I mean, eight to 15, even 20% return in a, a real estate transaction is like home run, right? Um, a lot of times in business acquisitions, you can see 50%, 75%, 2X, right? Now the risk is different, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention, so is the reward. Excellent. Okay, so I want to follow up on this a little bit more. So okay. let's say I decide to listen to you fundamental folks and I identify a business or a few types of businesses that I, I know a little bit about the space. I may know some people in them. They're interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And I want to be seen as one of these geniuses in 2025 who did the right thing and bought right. the right business. So what is my first step in going about looking for this business to buy? And where just where should we be looking to find these businesses that make the most sense? Sure. So the first thing I think is to think about the process to buy a business. And this won't be where most people recommend. But for me, having been in it for over a decade now and just seeing people try and be successful and try and fail, the ones that had an idea of what the process looked like were able to sustain and be more successful. What does that mean? I've had people call me and say, hey, Elliot, I want to buy a business, but I need to get a job in like five to six months. So I really need your help to help me find something, due diligence on it, and close it in like four months or so, so I can not have to take my job in six. Can you help me? And I try to tell them that that timeline just doesn't make sense. Um, Business acquisition can take longer because you're going to have to look at, you know, 25, 50, 75 companies. And so you want to have a year, really two years to to manage this process. So if you say, hey, I want to be smart in 2025, I think what you say is I need to dedicate at least a year to this. And then you need to go find companies that are available for sale. So the way you would do that is go to 
um, International Business Broker Association. So IBBA is their acronym, and go look them up. Find a list of brokers in your area, call them, email them, get in front of them, tell them that you want to buy a business, tell them how the business looks, and and you'll you'll start slow, but over time you'll have three deals you're looking at, then five, then ten, then twenty. Um, and being a an engineer and a bit of a nerd in some context, when you get to like thirty one, all of a sudden you'll have like a bell curve of opportunities, and now you'll know the top ten percent of deals in your pipeline. You might not know if you have a representative pipeline of all the deals in the world, but you'll know, hey, these at the top 10 percent of my portfolio of opportunities I'm looking at are way better than the bottom 90. And you'll naturally be able to spend more time on the ones that make more sense. After you sort of get some opportunities, here's, I think, where you have to make a decision. Do you go it alone and just be independent, um, figure out how to manage your diligence process? Do you know how to look at financials or private companies? Do you know how to interview sellers? Um, Do you know how to raise capital? And if those things are sort of things you're comfortable with, then you sort of go it alone, you grab your resources, you plan your tack, and you go. For a lot of people, because of the complexity of this marketplace, it makes a lot of sense to get an advisor that knows the process to help you through. Here's why. When you look at private company financials, you're looking at typically QuickBooks put together by somebody uh, who's not a CPA, who oftentimes is 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 a, a child of the owner or the owner's partner. And not saying that that's a, a bad financial person, just saying it's not the smartest financial resource in the city they live in doing their books. Their taxes are typically um, um, optimized so that they don't give Uncle Sam any extra uh, love at the end of the year. And and if you don't have a great ability to look through monthly financials and QuickBooks and kind of sniff through what's real and what's not, if you don't know how to sort of compare those to taxes, and then really, if you don't know how to link all of that stuff to bank statements, because what I tell people all the time, um, and I'm an owner, so I've used QuickBooks to do my financials. I can tell stories in QuickBooks. I can tell stories on my taxes. I cannot tell stories through the bank. The bank won't misrepresent the truth for me, for you, for anyone. And so the bank statements become sort of the crux of the analysis. If that's not stuff you feel comfortable doing, particularly thinking that, hey, I'm going to maybe put up $100,000 of equity and get $900,000 of debt that I'm personally responsible for. So taking a million dollar bet, you may want to spend a little bit of money to make sure you're doing it correctly. So I think you have the go it alone process, which look, we're entrepreneurs, a lot of people do it. Then there's the sort of get help um, sort of work stream. And I think for the size of bets that people are making, uh, if you're not experienced in this market, it would, it would make sense to get an advisor. Okay. So you've now jumped kind of from the buying into the due diligence, and this is your area of expertise. So I'd, I'd love to kind of jump into the due diligence. So let's sure. fast forward a little bit. Let's say we, we found a business that we think is interesting. Maybe we know the owner or we, we've worked with the broker to find a business. Mm-hmm. Um, we have um, run the numbers based on the data we've been given. So maybe it's Maybe it's uh, uh, just a T12, so trailing 12 months of, of financial data. Yep. Um, and um, we, we write up a uh, letter of intent or even a contract. We get the business under contract to buy. And now we have right. to start this process of actually verifying that everything the seller told us was true and verifying all the things the seller didn't tell us for one reason or another. They forgot. They don't want us to know whatever. Um, and this is kind of, this is in, in the real estate world, this is the mm-hmm. make or break. I mean, if you do yes. good due diligence, then yes. then you're likely setting yourself up for success in the project. If you do yes. bad due diligence, you're going to find surprises that are likely going to eat into your profit and maybe even cause you to lose money. That's so, right. so this is what you specialize in. Walk us through, um, it, let's say yesterday I got a business under contract. What am Mm. I doing today? What are you going to help me or tell me to do today to start that due diligence process? What are the big pieces we should be thinking about? Sure. So the first thing you need to understand in my mind is that due diligence is a painful process for a seller. And so you have to sort of prepare your mind and their mind for uh, a, a, a process. So for instance, my understanding of real estate due diligence is that it's in the magnitude of weeks. For business acquisition due diligence, you're talking three to six months with the same rigor. 
And so typically when you write your letter of intent or contract to buy a business, you say, hey, I'm willing to buy your business at, at this price with this structure. But to do my due diligence, I need the 30, I need the 90 day right to have exclusivity to look at this business. You cannot solicit other offers. And even if you solicit other offers, I need the 90 days to look through your business to see if I want to buy it. And, 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 and other people cannot buy it during that, that period. And so that's the first thing and sort of recognize where you are. Then you need to sit down and go through a due diligence checklist. You can find them on the web. You can find them on my site, guardiandudiligence.com, and go through the financial stuff that you need, the legal stuff that you need, the operational stuff that you need, the sort of ownership structure stuff that you need, and then like the industry data you need to feel comfortable having a picture of the business. And so after you provide this list to the seller, they're gonna provide you some portion of it and you guys are gonna spend weeks going back and forth on, no, I need more specific here, it's more specific there. What I advise my clients to do is look at the list as sort of here's the laundry list of things you need to understand. But Jay, you asked me where to go first. The first is the financial picture, here's why. Sellers will always tell you that their business is great, it's on the upswing, it, it's a market leader, and all of their contracts are sort of long-term and will last five years. But if you get into there and you find out that their profits are not strong, they're declining, none of this work is contractual, or the contracts don't have any volume um, promises, so they're not actually enforceable in any way, you probably will stop your diligence process and look at a different deal. And so the financial stuff is what you need to understand first. I think once you understand that, in my mind, the legal, you need to make sure the person you're talking to actually has the right to sell the business. You need to make sure that there are contracts with customers, that they're not uh, they're not um, contracts that will block your acquisition because sometimes those contracts will have change of control provisions. After you do financial, legal, then I think you're in the context of sort of operational industry and all the rest. And so if you go through in that sequential order, what it allows you to do is to stop. So if somebody says, hey, I have a million dollars of, of cash flow. So people buy businesses traditionally as a multiple of cash flow. So they say they have a million dollars of cash flow. You look at their financials, okay, but that's QuickBooks. You look at their taxes, okay, that's QuickBooks. Hey, send me your bank statements. Wait, I only see $700,000 of deposits here. How did you get to a million dollars with only $700,000 of deposits? Help me understand this. At that point, you would have spent a week or two in diligence as opposed to 90 days, because at that point, if it's that much less, you probably aren't going to want to do the deal. So you look at financials first, <clears throat> then legal stuff, then um, operational things. You do it sequentially so you can stop and you make sure that you have rigor, because here's what happens. You ask the seller for financials and they send you like trailing 12, but you want to know at least a couple of years. Hey, I need three years. Oh, mm, mm, mm. But you're the money. And so the, the deal doesn't happen until you're satisfied. So you have to push back. I need this. Hey, I need bank statements. Oh, I don't want to go talk to my banker. Or, they, or they'll print them out, scan them so you can't convert them to Excel and send you like 10 out of 12 months, right? Um, and you have to be strong enough to say, this is not what I need. I need them direct PDF so I can actually convert them to Excel and do my analysis. So you have to push... Um, just like in real estate, diligence is where the money's made. Diligence separates the novices from the experts, um, the folks that are getting maximum return versus those that are losing their money. And and the seller has an incentive, I don't want to say to lie, but the seller tell just- Tell a story. To tell a story. <laughs> um, and can you explain why a dollar to uh, to the seller, like if they, if they can get you to believe that the business has made a dollar more than it has, why that dollar is more valuable to the seller than it is to the buyer? Oh, for sure. And you said you had a phrase that you use. I use this one often. Because people buy a business as a multiple of cash flow, right? So for businesses that most people are going to be looking at, just to call it four times cash flow is kind of generally it. Um, if the seller convinces you that they had a dollar more of cash flow, you're not going to pay a dollar more for the business. You're going to pay four dollars more for the business. So each story the seller tells, he gets a multiple benefit for it. And so that's why... You really have to be good here because this is probably the time in a seller's life or a person's life where they have one of the highest incentives to lie, right? Because it's not like my lie gets me a dollar for dollar benefit. It gets the multiplier effect. And the reality is 
as soon as the transaction occurs, there's no give backs. There's no mulligans. There's no oops. The the requirement and the burden of due diligence is on the buyer. And so you have to be really good because some stories sound reasonable, but are very hard to check, Jane Carroll. So for instance, a lot of times you get people to say they're an absentee owner, right? They have an office in the business, but they, oh, I'm never there. I play a lot of golf. Uh, I, I go fishing, you know. My office manager runs that thing. You know, don't even worry about it. Don't take me out of the expenses because I'm really not in, uh, heavily uh, in the business anymore. So that representation would take $100,000 that actually was an expense of the business. Let's say that they made $100,000 last year. And it'll it'll take that from cost into cash flow. So now you're going to pay a 4X multiple on that story. Well, how do you check that, Jay? And so a lot of people will believe stories like that. Or, hey, I have a market-leading product. I have very sticky customers. Well, how do you check that, right? And so getting good at realizing that there's a huge motivation for people to tell stories and then a huge motivation for the work of getting the data necessary to understand the answer can be tough as well. That's where sort of you have this graveyard of people who have made bad acquisitions, right, and wish they had spent more time and diligence, wish they had dealt with people who advisors or otherwise that knew the industry better or wish that they had spent, you know, a couple more days uh, testing things. So, yeah, you get a multiplier on your story as a seller. Yeah. And and I think you just I, that may be the single most important point when it comes to buying a business that our listeners should keep in mind. If a seller can convince you that their business makes even a single dollar for every single dollar they can convince you that their business makes more than it does that's four dollars more that you're paying for that business than it's worth and and that's so right. and so i think if, if our listeners do nothing more than keep that in mind that their risk is four times as high as the seller's incentive to lie or misrepresent i don't want to say yes. lie um, yes. um or, or tell a story um that's really going to save us a lot of money because we're always going to go in with that attitude that the seller has and a huge incentive to inflate that number because it's going to get them four times maybe more than four times um every, every dollar that they can convince us and jay I, I like your refocus on the four times that's true also the other reality in business acquisitions is that the seller is is represented oftentimes by a business broker. And the business broker is motivated as well because they get a percentage of the, the purchase price of the deal size. And so if the broker or the seller can convince you of a dollar more value, they're both incented to do so. And so the broker will say things that don't, don't show up in the numbers that the seller will try to support as best he can to get the purchase price the broker advised him he could get in the market and you as the buyer need to make sure you're not paying four times on a story awesome so i want to know even more elliot this is so fascinating to me like awesome. i'm thinking about these stories that can be manufactured and spun however necessary so kind of twofold question Sure. What what does someone like yourself, somebody like your firm, how do you go about uncovering the truth behind those stories? Like in everyday real life practice, how do you get to the bottom of what's really happening as part of diligence? And also wondering if you have any kind of case study stories you might be able to share with us. Sure. So the way that you get to the bottom is that you've seen so many different plays being ran, stories being told and you check the data on them to know how to quickly get to the facts so that you can quickly move from story to sort of verifiable piece of data to believability, yes, no. Um, so what does that mean in abstract? And then I'll, I'll give you sort of a, a case study example. In abstract, I often find people say things like, um, I have a market leading product. I sell widgets into manufacturing, but I have a market leading product. So once I hear market leading product, right? What that means in business is I'm able to sell my product at a higher price than my competition because their market lagging. So that means my gross margin should be higher than the industry average. So now seller, let me see your an income statement. Let me look at your gross margin. Is it higher than the average in the industry? And you can look at EBIS world or other sort of um, data sets to figure out what the average gross margin is. And, and if it's not, then the seller told me it's market leading. The financials don't prove that out. Now, I don't necessarily kick the deal out, 
But I sort of know that this person is willing to say things that aren't qualified in the data. So I'm on one side of the world in business buying, right? Whereas if somebody sort of tells me a bunch of things and I check a bunch of things and they all come out true, I feel a different way. So how does that work in practice? So I was helping um, two guys in Connecticut who wanted to buy a business um, a couple hours south of Atlanta. And they one, one had worked in sort of public market investing. So they had looked at like, you know, Coca-Cola or Home Depot's financials. So sort of understood that. The other one was a teacher and so not very familiar. And they were buying an HVAC company. And a lot of the things that I'm talking about came up. So the seller um, was the owner and CEO. His wife was the bookkeeper. She said she was part-time, but we had to sort of check to see what part-time meant because part-time meant we're reallocating her full salary to cost or half. And so we went through that process to see, well, if I can call her at 8 o'clock, at 12 o'clock, at 2 o'clock, at 5 o'clock, and she's always at the office, that's not really part-time, right? Um, and so you check it to see if it's true, and then you adjust your, your, your idea of profit and cash flow uh, commiserately. Um, another issue that we had, I think, was um, we were told that a lot of their business was contractual and repeat. And people always use the word recurring. Whenever I hear recurring, I'm like, <laughs> show it to me. And so when we looked in the numbers, um, it was repeat, meaning people did business with them on a repeat basis. But it wasn't like a SaaS company online where I'm paying some like Spotify five dollars a month. It wasn't a machine of that nature. And so those kind of things had us go from, you know, let's call it X dollars of cash flow. And we adjusted to some, you know, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, whatever percentage of cash flow. And the purchase price ended up being lower as a result of some of the diligence that we were able to help the customer do. They also felt more comfortable because looking at the financials and understanding the seller mentality in these type of deals requires a decade of experience. It requires somebody who's been around the block because keep in mind who you're questioning. So it'd be like me questioning Jay and Carol about this podcast. Like they know so much more than I do. If I'm a first time person doing this process, there's no way I'm gonna get to know your business enough to be able to buy it the first time doing the full process. Like now the hundredth time I've talked to sellers about their company, now I'm very efficient and good. In fact, at this point, I just have conversations with sellers for a day and I'll go through a 50 item checklist and never ask like a direct question or a sequential check off next, next, next. And then I'll go home and I'll be able to answer the 50 question checklist, but the seller will feel like it was just a conversation. And so um, that's sort of how you do it. And then an example of how it was done. Yeah, I, I, I love that. And it's, it's, just like due diligence with everything else, and I know I always go back to real estate, but a lot of our listeners are, are real estate investors. Um, you walk into somebody's house, if they have a stain on the carpet, it's not hard to, it, it's a lot easier to hide that stain if you're yes. the seller than it is for you to find that stain. Because yes. what are you gonna do? Are you gonna move every piece of furniture? Are you going to look through every drawer and every cabinet? Are you gonna open every door and every drawer? Well. Yes. In real estate, maybe we don't do that because uh, to replace the carpet isn't that much. But in business, this could be the, the make or break. And so you do have to move every piece of furniture. You do have to open every drawer. You do have to, to, to look in every, every space. Um, and, and that's why for, for business, due diligence, like you said, could be a three, four, five, six month process versus right. in real estate where it may be a few days, maybe a week. Yeah. And, and to make an analogy, the carpet may or may not break the deal, but if the foundation's off or shifting, then then that's different. Um, if if the house next door is about to be condemned and that will change the value of your of your sort of real estate, that's significant. If um, if you're th there's certain things that I think even in real estate are so fundamental to the value that you have to check them. The other thing um, I compare myself to like a home inspector if you're doing sort of residential real estate uh, or a good appraiser on the commercial side. That person's worth their weight in gold because they're the one that's like, that smells like something different in the house. I've smelt that before. Show me the furnace. Oh, the furnace is on its last leg. But like, I not I may not have been able to do that, but that person did it right away. Or, hey, I'm stepping on the, this feels a little faulty. 
let me let me go check the foundation here. And so it's it's worth its weight in gold to get someone who understands those things very, very well, because you're right in due diligence, you get such a small window relative to the history of the business to determine if this business is what you say it is. And and you know that you could tell a story about your house or let's even go to cars. I use cars as a great analogy. You know, you could tell a story all day about your Chevy Impala that's got all the records in the dashboard and all the, the brand new tires and look how clean it is on the inside. But, you know, a real good person in diligence will be able to pop the hood and take a look at the engine, which is really what's driving the value of this car and be able to critique it. And you need to be sure that either you can do that or you work with somebody who can do that. So, Elliot, this has been absolutely awesome. I know one of the topics that our listeners absolutely love, and again, always goes back to real estate, but we talk about this a lot in real estate, is seller financing. So <coughs> for buyers that are buying a business under the five or $6 million mark, where they're, they're probably using some of their own cash, they're probably using bank financing or SBA financing, um, but they want to leg up so they don't have to come with as much cash. Um, right. The bank or SBA might be financing seven 75 to 90 percent what about seller financing what about getting the seller to contribute equity that they have in their business to the deal um, to reduce the amount of cash that that the buyer has to come with what should we be thinking about with seller financing what percentage of a deal can we typically get seller financing on uh, how should we be talking about a sell to, to a, a business seller about seller financing mm-hmm. any anything you want to share about seller financing I, I think our sure. listeners would love So in acquisition talk, people spend a lot of time on structure. How do you structure your deal? And when they talk about structure, they're talking about what Jay was speaking of, the capital structure. Sort of if you need to buy a $5 million business, well, where is the $5 million coming from? Specifically on seller financing, you want to be in the zone of sort of 20 to 40 percent in some way, shape or form if you can um, sometimes the SBA will limit some of your flexibility in that, but there's some, there's some, there's some, uh, uh, what's the word, uh, fancy ways to, to sort of get around some of those things. And so if you talk to the right, the lawyer who understands sort of how that works, you can sort of make sure, but 20 to 40%. So Elliot, why is it 20 to 40% and not 70% or 10%? Here's the logic. I think from sort of having been in this for a decade that actually comes to bear. If I'm putting up $5 million on your company to take it for the next five years to get my return, and and you, let's just say it's you, Jay, you've known this company for 20 years. It's your baby. You understand that you put all the processes in. The reason I want seller financing is because I want you to be betting on my ability to run your company for five years for you to get your money out because you know the asset better than me So if you wouldn't bet 20% to 40% of this purchase price on me running your business, then I actually shouldn't be buying it because you're smarter than me on this business, right? And so to me, that's the logic around seller financing. Um, How does that really come up? So one of the things that happens, you typically have like a six month to two year, sometimes even longer employment agreement with the seller after close. And I think... You have sort of the academic schoolboy thought, oh, I'll pay the guy $5 million at purchase price, and then I'll pay him $75,000 for a consultant for five years. I have it all figured out. Does a guy who took on $5 million show up for $75,000? That's a no. really good point. Not when it gets tough, not when you need him, right? Your number one customer leaves. He's on the beach. Is that guy showing up? No. But if you still owe him 20 to 40 percent of the purchase price, he's taking your call on the beach. He's in South America hanging out, but he gets back to you in the same day. And so that's why you want to have seller financing, because it ties the seller to the future outcomes of the business. So it also becomes an extension of diligence. So you you asked a finite set of questions in diligence. Um, you're not going to be able to ask an exhaustive list. And that would take until eternity. Right. So you may have not asked a question two months into your operation of the business. A customer calls up and says, hey, um, you know, Jay told me he was going to give me 20 percent discount on on your services for next year because it's thing I did last year. So I'm going to pay you you know, 20 percent less. Well, I need Jay to pick up my call to get on the phone with this guy to say he's lying 
so I don't have an argument with my customer. And so all those things are sort of wrapped up in the logic around uh, seller financing and the importance of it. Love that. Absolutely love that. That it, it, it's it, you, you put that absolutely perfectly. You hand a guy $5 million. Is he going to show up for $75,000 a year after that? And seller financing is literally the best way to ensure that the seller picks up the phone, whether it's six months or a year or two years after you purchase the business, when you run into a problem, you want to know that the seller is going to pick up the phone and help you. And the literally the best way to do that is for the seller to know that, that he still is owed money. Um, and, and that he has to help you because otherwise he's putting his own money at risk. That's right. I mean, one of my favorite business books is How to Win Friends and Influence People. And it's helped me so much in business because you need to always be thinking about what are the incentives of my counterparty? And, and when you think about a $5 million check and how important a $75,000 check is after a $5 million check, if I put my head in the seat of the seller, uh, you know, $75,000 is a rounding error. I'm going to pay more in taxes. And there's a lot of instances where in this process, you really have to almost like stop, take a step back. I'm not Elliot anymore. Now think about I'm the seller. How would I perceive this? How would I think about this? What are my incentives? Because a lot of people get excited about the, the concept of buying a business, but not truly thinking about the complexities of a business and also the incentives of the seller, both during your diligence period, which is going to be really intense, but also the year after you close the deal. You're going to need a lot of help from that person. Excellent. Okay, great. So I would really like to know, right? I'm just, Elliot, I'm just like an everyday regular person. I'm just, you know, I'm a mom. I invest. I juggle a lot of different things. This idea right. of buying a business is awesome, but it's also pretty darn scary and frightening. I mean, there are so many different components involved, right? To make sure right. it's the right one from finding it to the initial review, to funding and financing it, to a very daunting and extensive diligence process. How do, how do I, as just a regular everyday person, become comfortable going down this type of road that I've not necessarily done before? Absolutely. Um, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked it. So how does the everyday person get comfortable? I think what you do <laughs> is you, you study this game just like you study any other games. So there are resources to actually get you comfortable. Uh, there's a book called Buyout by Rick Rickerston that's amazing. Um, Walker Dybul has a book, uh, Buy Then Build, that's pretty good. And, and you want to sort of immerse yourself in people who have successfully done it. There's a lot of everyday people I call Main Street folks that have executed amazing transactions that, you know, two years ago, you know, were a mom juggling a bunch of things, considering other investments just like you. Here's the other thing. So a lot of people manage their advisor relationships based on trust, and I totally get that. But in the game of buying businesses, you really want advisors who are experienced in this particular complicated thing because you want a transaction attorney that's actually done business transactions. You're going to want an accounting group person that's done transactions. And, and not only is it important because they're familiar with the, the concepts and sort of what's going on, but here's where it really comes to bear. If you get advisors who are not comfortable with the acquisition process, they're gonna perceive a dollar worth of risk as it being $5 worth of risk. But what does that mean for you as the buyer? What that means is you're gonna spend five times the amount of money on your lawyer because they're getting comfortable with things, they're uncomfortable with this. When a, a seasoned sort of uh, transaction advisor We'll say, oh, that's an issue, but that's that's five dollars worth of risk. That's not spend, you know, two fifty an hour on me to solve it. That's just an okay thing. Move on. So I think you get you you do your studying. I think you you find advisors that'll help. Um, Guardian due diligence, my business was specifically made to help sort of bridge the gap between a person who may not be experienced in this particular process and helping them execute an amazing transaction. Um, helping them do this process. So finding good lawyers, finding good accountants. Um, and sometimes as an investor, you just have to make a bet, right? So you know, there's, this, there's this amazing thing that you think can double. Um, and there's a bunch of information you've looked at, but at the end of the day, you kind of have that clinching feeling of like, am I going to put $100,000 of my money in this thing? Am I really going to do it? And I think sometimes the services that we provide at Guardian just help people get comfortable with that 
risky decision and helping them say, hey, well, the last five people who I've seen in this similar situation did this and this is how it worked. And the other five people who didn't work out all that well did these things and went like this. And so given this data set of like 10 years of being in this business, I can help people make these decisions easier. But you should absolutely feel comfortable. Um, This is not something that's out of reach. And in fact, to put it even more close to home, the market is moving towards the everyday person buying businesses. Um, You can read about it, but also just think about all the baby boomers, the 60 year olds, the 70 year olds that came back from World War II and started businesses. Those folks are holding on to companies that are their retirement. That's how they get to Florida. That's how they get to the Bahamas. They only get there if they sell their business. Well, how does a Main Street guy or gal sell their business? They sell it to another Main Street guy or gal. So people are perfectly positioned to do this. They should not feel intimidated. Okay, this has been absolutely fantastic. I now want to jump into the segment of the show that we call Four More, and that's where we ask you the same four questions that we ask all of our guests, rapid fire format. Um, And then the more part of the Four More is where we're going to let you tell us where our listeners can get in touch with you and find out more about you and your business. Sound good? Awesome. Let's do it. Okay, Um, let's do it. I'll take question number one. So, Elliot, what was your very first or your very worst job, and what lessons did you take from it that you're still using today? Yeah, I won't say the company name. It was a company that rounded up a bunch of high school folks or sort of uh, wayward souls and put them on painting jobs on houses um, and, get, and promised, you know, $14, $15 an hour. And you go up here, and you're painting your first house, and you're on the ladder, and you're feeling like, man, I can't wait to make these $14. But when you actually realize what it was, it was a um, a job based payment program that only netted fourteen dollars if the company uh, assessed the job correctly, and the manager of the job allocated uh, the dollars on the job appropriately to you. So I ended up getting sort of my first indication of what I was going to get paid, and it was like four dollars an hour, not that fourteen. So I'm fighting bees and up on ladders. Uh, so needless to say, I, I stepped away from that job. <laughs> For good reason. That is yes. crazy. Yeah, crazy. It was crazy. Oh my gosh. I have two different questions I want to ask for the second one. Okay. Um, so Jay, I might just make this a, a, a part A and a part B. I'm curious to know, Elliot, when did you first realize, because you've mentioned that you've you've started a couple businesses in addition to Guardian, when did you first realize that you had that entrepreneurial itch? Um, I think it was right after finishing Harvard Business School when I had an amazing job in Boston doing business acquisitions with some just amazing people. Um, but for a lot of reasons, I didn't enjoy Boston. I think uh, you guys have made some decisions to get to warmer places. Uh, I had moved my family from Michigan here to Atlanta. So I moved to Atlanta and there just weren't as many opportunities in the field that I wanted to embark upon here for me to go get a job. And so as a result of me choosing some personal things in my career that mattered, it sort of forced my hand to be more entrepreneurial. So probably a year or two after Harvard Business School, my hand was sort of forced. And I think for me, I wanted to create a life that I wanted to live in. I had I had been in many jobs where as I looked up at the partners, I didn't want that life. So doing well at this current job is going to put me there. I don't want to be there. I want to create a machine I actually want to drive. So that was sort of when I knew. Love that. Love that. And so the follow up kind of uh, part B to that question is, what is the best piece of advice that you have for other entrepreneurs or other small business owners that you haven't shared yet today? Yeah. So it's a piece of advice that uh, a mentor gave me before I went to business school. And it felt so trite. That's easy. But it really does determine how I look at businesses on the first pass. The advice was when you look at business opportunities, the things you have to look at are sort of profitability of the business, right? Growth of the business and ownership. How much do you own? And and really, it was funny because it was before business school. And then when I went to business school and learning all these fancy things, the, the price of a stock, you know what drives that price? Profitability, growth, and then your share is the ownership, right? And so it becomes such a great sort of simple way to evaluate. Like, I don't want to be in a 5% margin business. I don't want to be in a business that grows 1% a year. You know, those are things that I can sort of figure out easier now. Love that. Great. Love that. Okay. Question number three. And I know you've already mentioned three books that you love, How to Win Friends and Influence People, 
buy out and then buy, then build. And we actually had Walker on the show a couple months ago. He was fantastic. Oh, excellent. Are there any other business books or any books? I'm, I'm not going to limit it to business. What's your favorite business or book out there that you would recommend to our listeners that they may not have read? Sure. Um, you know, for me, this is going to be a bit personal and that's just how we roll. So, um, there's a book about Reginald Lewis, uh, who's the first black man to buy a billion dollar business. Um, and he came from Eagle Beginnings and uh, went to an HBCU and kind of finessed his way into Harvard Law School, uh, worked on Wall Street as a lawyer for 10 years and then acquired a business. Um, but it took him uh, many years. And it, it's one of the best books about sort of overcoming adversity and, and making it through some very tough uh, waters to sort of be successful. And then to sort of understand how like your first success can lead to future successes. And the book has a weird title. It's um, why should white guys have all the fun? So people tend to have all this reaction to the book. Oh my gosh. And I'm not getting into that broader discussion. Um, I, I think we have enough understanding of diversity now to realize that we all should have an ability to have some fun. So uh, uh, Reginald Lewis's book, um, why should white guys have all the fun would be the other one. I would recommend. And, and the book is both about Reginald Lewis and he wrote the book. Is that correct? Um, he he had another author write, I think, the most of it. I forget. I've met the guy who wrote the book. Blair but Walker. I can't think of his name, and that's terrible. Blair Walker. And and I yes. didn't know I yes. didn't know that off the top of my head. I'm actually looking it up right now. So computers are so great. Uh, and I met, <laughs> I met awesome. Reginald Lewis's wife, Lloyda Lewis, um, at an event in Chicago uh, last year, and it was just earth changing because you know, no matter what color creed you are, it's really. How can you have some fun, whether you're a woman and you're not the typical buyer, whether you're you're Indian or Asian or short or poor or or, or not from sort of rich beginnings? It kind of walks you through all of that. Why, awesome. why should white guys have all the fun? How Reginald Lewis created a billion dollar business empire. And for anybody who wants to uh, to to get a link to that, we'll have it in the show notes. Awesome. Okay, cool. And the fourth question is a fun one. What is sure. something, Elliot, in your personal or work life that you have splurged on along the way that was totally worth it, whether it's a material thing or an experience or whatever you consider a fantastically awesome splurge? Um, I splurge on vacations. Uh, that's where I kind of overspend. And so for me, finding really cool both boutique hotels either in major cities or in the mountains um is sort of my thing and so um you know some people have like a bag or some luggage or like a car i didn't really go there but i i'll find kind of fancy places to stay in the mountains or outside of cities um i just love the charm of a boutique hotel it's such an independent instance of somebody putting together this perfectly curated thing for people to enjoy and I get a kick out of finding those unique places. That is very cool. And it, you know, just a, a funny side note, talk about just a personal thing. Last night we were in the car with our kids on the way uh -huh. to ice cream. And yeah. out of the blue, our 10 year old says, says, I have a weird vocab word this week. It's bespoke. And we're like, you know yes. what? Bespoke is such a cool thing. Bespoke is so big right now, like your hotel experiences, yes. right? And we are explaining yes. to him, they are these things and experiences that are very particularly thought through and beautifully curated. And that yep. is bespoke. So it sounds like you enjoy those bespoke, bespoke. hotel experiences. That's right. That's right. I really do enjoy that. So that's, cool. that's where I splurge. Wow. Love it. Wow. A business podcast that you can also prepare for your SATs. I love it. There, yes. <laughs> M multiple points of value. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> awesome. Okay, Elliot, this is now the more part of the four more. Can you tell our listeners where they can find out more about you, where they can find out more about Guardian Due Diligence and how they can connect with you and anything else you want to tell us about? Yeah, absolutely. So I am very active on LinkedIn. So um, you can find me, uh, Elliot Holland, two L's, two T's. Um, I'm very active on LinkedIn and will reply there quickly. You can also visit my website, um, guardiandudiligence.com. Um, there you can set up office hours with me. You can also um, get a view of our services. We like to say we, we basically participate as a private equity deal team available to help you on a part-time fractional basis. And so if you have any needs in your business acquisition pursuit, that's what we do. Um, 
You can also email me or call me. My phone number and my email are on the bottom of the website. Um, and I'm very responsive and would love to hear from anyone who has any questions about the business buying process or a deal you're looking at or evaluation you're struggling with. Or um, like Jay said, you're in the middle of a process, but you want to sleep better. You want some more comfort. Uh, give me a call. Awesome. Elliot, this has been an absolutely fantastic tip-filled episode and we really appreciate you and we thank you for coming on and um and we look forward to talking to you again in the near future i love this i've enjoyed it your energy has been amazing i'm looking forward to uh experiencing how your your, your guests uh enjoy the podcast and, and thank you for your time today absolutely thank you, thank you elliot jay Seriously, how awesome was that episode? Elliot had so much great information. And remember how before we got started, I was talking about being grateful for technology. What an amazing example right there. Because of this awesome technology, we get to connect with people like Elliot, people around the country, around the world who are connecting with other people to help them make the right decisions in buying businesses and creating a better life for themselves. So Elliot, thank you for all that great information. And listeners, I really hope that you got as much out of it as I did. There are so many great tips in there. And I really feel that Elliot took a lot of complex subjects and broke them down in a way that was really relatable for each and every one of us. Absolutely. I, my favorite tip, not my favorite, because there were so many great tips, but one of my favorite tips was just his point about seller financing and basically how to ensure that the uh, that the the seller of the business is willing to pick up the phone if you ever have an issue. And the way he, he stated it, which is basically, yeah, you can have a consulting agreement with the seller for a couple years, but that $75,000 or $50,000 or $100,000 a year that you might be paying him to to help you with the business pales into com in comparison to the 5 million or 3 million or whatever you paid him to buy the business. So if you really want to keep the seller vested in the success of the business, seller financing is the best way to do that. So I just, I love that tip and so many other great tips in this episode. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks Elliot for being on. Alrighty. Are we good for this week? We are so good. Let's wrap it up. Alrighty, everybody. Thank you so much once again for tuning in. We appreciate you and have an amazing, happy, and healthy rest of your week. She's Carol. I'm Jay. Now work with a great advisor and get on your business buying journey today. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> everybody have a wonderful week. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks to Elliot for an awesome show. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody.